Newport City Council meeting to order for Monday, April 16, 2018, 6.30 p.m. All members of the council are present. Others include James Johnson, our clerk treasurer, and Laura Dogan, our city manager. Before we go into the agenda, I need to make a couple corrections and one addition. If you look at the current agenda, it had number nine. The new business should have been a Mr. Carriage return. It should have been number uh, 10 for new business. And then also, right before a new business, we need to add the early childhood parade. If the council is okay with that. Because I think that came in after the agenda had been put out and we didn't need a decision. And we won't be meeting before they have their event. So with that, I'll move on. The next item is to approve the minutes of April 2nd, 2018. I will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll make the motion that we approve the minutes of April 2nd, 2018, as presented. The motion has been made. Is there a second? No second. Made and seconded. Any discussion on the minutes? Corrections? Anything? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. The next item is comments by members of the public. Um, this is an opportunity for members to discuss items which are not on the agenda uh, at this time. So if it's not an agenda item and you signed up uh, and you wish to speak, then I guess it's all agenda. No, I, I signed up. Can okay. you hold this please, please? <laughs> Um, I would just like to urge the council to approve the request for water for Fresh Start Community Farm, um, and also uh, to be as supportive as possible. To that's an agenda item. Oh, the, yeah, that's an agenda item. Okay. That's water request. Okay. Fresh, that's number six on the agenda. Great. I'll comment then. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> then we'll move on. The next item is the event policy review and vote. And at this time, I'd like Jessica Booth to come up. <coughs> so here we are, take two. Um, if the council wishes, I'll go through and talk about the changes that were made from last time. Would that be a good place to start? Yes. Okay. So, um, second draft here, we took a, 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 some, we entertained some things from quite a few different places. The council members sent me a lot of um, more sample policies, so I had some glances at those from other communities. And as you guys saw, I'm sure, while you're researching, there's a ton, there's a ton of different ones. So what we're looking at tonight is trying to figure out what is going to work best for Newport, our community. So taking things from all those and hopefully finding something that can help us with our stuff. So um, I guess the first thing here is the bottom of the first page. Um, we did add in this portion at the very uh, bullet number one five, where it says grants may be based upon reimbursement model where receipts for reimbursement must be provided or where the city pays vendors directly. We thought that this might be a good thing to add in there so that we can have an idea of what the money is being spent on if we do make a, a financial donation. That way we're spending, we're, we're paying vendors directly. There's no question as to what things are being spent on. It's just a little bit of a control thing there. <coughs> Um, the next item, there was just a one word change, but it changed a little bit of the sentence to the next bullet where it says, in an effort to create long-term value for the community and to encourage a sustainable business model for third-party organizers, requests for city funding should be considered an initial allocation. Before that said a one-time allocation, we understand that there may be times when there's more than one you know, request for coming in from an event organizer depending on if they're doing multiple events throughout the year or something like that. So that, that allowed us a little bit more freedom. But still with the understanding that we're hoping that this is an initial allocation to start up events, not necessarily a sustained um, allocation that's going to continue to happen at the same rate. Um, the next one would be uh, two bullets down there, it says priority is given to groups or organizations with an established nonprofit status as defined by the IRS. 
We just clean that up a little bit and put as defined by the IRS, easier than having um, state or federal in there. Just clean that up a little bit. Uh, the last thing, which is probably the most important, which is what we received the most feedback on, was the very last uh, item in the procedure. So number seven, uh, we did have the account, account space um, uh, diagram in there. I was using that as a model for folks to come back with a summary or a report after the event. To, we kind of loosened that up a little bit to add a little bit more freedom in those presentations as they come back and just made it a pretty generic statement that said a posted event debrief with Newport City Council will occur within 30 days to gauge the success of the event and determine future plans. If folks need help um, with what kind of presentation to bring back to Council and they are looking for that guidance, I certainly can provide them with what kinds of things would be helpful for you guys to see when they're debriefing their event similar to how we debrief our events in the rec department, um, and that can help guide them if they're looking for that. If not, they can, um, that gives them the freedom to kind of come back with you however they'd like to lay out their presentation. <coughs> so those were the changes that were made from the first draft that you guys saw. How are we feeling about this now? Um, I've got a question. Could you clarify the one that you changed, uh, and that was the priority is given to groups or organizations. That was that third bullet down on page three. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that we really need in there at all? Or how did you come up with, with that wording? Because I hate to see priority given to basically anybody. We should treat all applications evenly. So, Sure. So my thought process there was anyone that is um, established as a nonprofit, as defined by the IRS, has to meet a certain set of criteria, which may be the same kind of criteria that we're looking for. So a nonprofit with the IRS, they, um, I believe, uh, looking into it a little bit, that the criteria that's required of them is that they, they don't engage in political lobbying, which seems like something, if this is a political event, we wouldn't necessarily want to give priority to that. Um, and inurement, so being a nonprofit ensures that no shareholder or other insider is receiving a personal benefit from any of the funds that are being raised by an event. Um, and then uh, being a nonprofit also encourages, or I think the criteria from the IRS standpoint is that the mission is, it benefits the, the public or it's a civic mission that is kind of all encompassing as opposed to a private interest type thing. So this wouldn't be. And it's, we could eliminate that if we want to. Well, I, the way I was just looking at it is, it seemed to me that you were almost giving priority, obviously, it says, to a nonprofit versus a for profit. Yeah. And if you were looking at two applications that were identical in nature, would you choose the nonprofit mission or the one with the nonprofit or the nonprofit status, knowing that all of these things, that it means all of these things over someone that didn't have that status? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, if you find that limiting, that's, to, that's up to the council if you want. You know. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I would, I would certainly be interested in hearing what you know, the might consider if they, if they so choose. And just understand too that because we put priority as given, it doesn't. It's not restricting to us. There's always wiggle room. If there was an insinuating circumstance that meant yes, this is a this is a for profit, but we really like what they're going for and what they're trying to do here, you, you, you have room by the language in there to decide as you wish on a case by case basis. That's what the council is going to find. Each and every event that's going to come to you is going to be unique in its own way. And you're going to have to do it based on a lot of different factors. This is just one of the factors that you might consider. Thank you. Okay. Other comments from council members? Yeah. Oh, just, just Ross. I went through and um, I don't know why you used the term third party. Because third party would be, if an agency wanted to have an event, a third party would be somebody that represented it for them. <coughs> so there isn't necessarily a third party involved when an organization wants to create an event. So in, for the purposes of this policy, we use third party to classify any event that's not directly hosted by the city. So this, the rec department ourselves, we have many events. We have the Halloween events and the, you know, the Easter events and all of those things. Third party for this means that anyone that's coming to the city that is outside of the city organization. So that was the best term. We did have um, a different term in there 
an uh, external start. event. It was, in, was the first term that I started to use, but that wasn't really clear. The idea is that there's no affiliation with the actual municipality. That's what a third party means to me. So we could clarify that and put that in there. I, 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 you know, who would the third party be that would uh, evaluate whether, I mean, wouldn't it be the rec committee or would it be the council? Who would, who would that third party be that would get involved? So any entity that comes in, Umbrella, for example, they have a, an application in for pause for the cause. They are not, they're not the city. It's not a city event. Right. It's Umbrella that wants to come in and do their own event. Yes. And they'll fill out an application. Yes. So only two people are involved, the city and Umbrella. So there's no third party involved in that transaction. So you're saying they want it to be a second party or outside party. entity? <coughs> I, I just don't know. You know, but there's no third party involved in those transactions. It's the agency and the city. So there's just two two people doing the doing the doing it. And I went through and I, I'm not sure if I was right, but I thought part of this was so that we wouldn't be co sponsors on a lot of stuff. And a lot of these things tie us into being co sponsors. And I thought that was part of the thing that we're trying to eliminate. So when um, like the objectives to appropriately plan for events held in Newport by identifying suitable entities. Who identifies the suitable entities? So when someone comes to the rec department, we get a lot of requests regularly. Right. And some of them are just uh, a person that comes off the street and they say, Hey, I want I want to have a um, an adult gym put in the park. And we say, Okay. What, you know, what are you looking to do? Do you want to help fundraise that? Do you want to start a committee on that? Do you yourself want to be a benefactor and, and pay to put that in there? Um, so when, when we have, we have to kind of sift through those who have the qualifications to be able to host a safe event for our community and those who are just kind of in like, hey, you know what would be cool in our community? And then they realize the amount of work that's behind it and they're like, whoa, okay, maybe not. So it, it is our responsibility and I'm the first um, Funnel. It funnels through me to you guys. So if they pass my test, and I believe, and they are willing to, um, you know, put put forth a, a quality event for our community that's safe for everyone, then I then would bring it to Laura. We discuss it there. The department heads also have um, impact on that when we have our large event applications, and then it eventually comes to you guys for approval. So it has to meet all of these checks before it even gets to you guys. Because if we were to give you every single person that comes in our door. No, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> and I had, uh, under the policy, the majority of funds raised at charity or fundraising events are used to support specific programs or services that benefit Newport City residents. A lot of the coin, coin drops uh, benefit the organizations. So it's not all encompassing. Coin drops, um, maybe I'm not catching on. Coin drops fall under a different policy. And I don't think that coin drops go before the rec committee. I think okay, so coin it's not drops, considered an event. No, coin drops have a policy, <coughs> and they have to have their letters filed by January 30th. We compile them, and they all come to the city council. So, and if we had, I, th I think if I'm if I'm catching what you're saying here, Dan, you're saying that if somebody's coming forth with a, a Relay for Life or a Halo Foundation fundraiser. Right. It's not it's not restricted to Newport residents, but you can imagine that some of the, the people benefiting from the Halo are Newport residents. So that's one of those pieces of criteria that we may consider. Is this benefiting Newport residents, or is this fundraiser that's coming in going to benefit a Montpelier um, organization or Montpelier schools, or if for some reason, if that were to ever come to town? Is the money being made at this fundraising event supporting our the people that are essentially subsidizing it, the taxpayers? We want to make sure that they're getting all the Now, one of the things that I gave you a bunch of examples, and one of the things that we talked about was the application itself has most of the information that you would find in most of those events. Mm -hmm. And to me, if we're going to do this, it's, to me, this is kind of more like a policy paper than it is an event. Yes, it is. If this policy is only for the purposes of the council deciding whether they want to fund a, an event, it is not deciding whether so, an event is planned. 
plan so, properly. Or... So the subject might be uh, council event policy. It was the, actually the city of Newport policy. It was actually the council that asked us to come forward. So when, when you put event in it, you have an application for events. And, and most of the information that you would really need to understand what the event policy is. So at a minimum, you should attach it to this policy so people can see all the information. The forms. They get all of those forms actually before they get this policy. I, I understand, but if we're going to create this and say, this is our policy, I think the application should be part of it, not just you can go here and see it. I, you know, I don't think very many people go to the policy but go to the application to see what the policy is, you know, because the, the policy has the um, cost, right? How much it costs to rent, you know? And I, I see things like the gazebo that has the music, you know, the old guys and young guys get out there and they have their Wednesday night, right? And they all volunteer, you know, hopefully some group like that is never going to get charged for using that facility because it brings the community together. The community lives there. So, you know, so I guess you see where I'm coming from. This looks more like a memorandum than it does a policy. So I think what you're saying is when folks come in to apply for it, to an event, they should get this policy right up front. Yes, so this is along with know, the application. Yes, they would. Should, it should be one and not two. We will. And so once we get that, once we get this finalized, this will go out with any large event application that, that if somebody asks me for a large event application, this will be attached to it. Just like our donation form. I mean, at, at this point, the only people looking at this that are concerned are a few people that know about it mm -hmm. and, and the council. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something like this has had minimal public input. You know what? I'm not a one-eyed kind of person. I like to get information from people before I decide on something. And if the public hasn't had a good opportunity to study what we're doing, we're doing them a disservice. Any other thoughts? No, I was just going to comment on what Dan was saying earlier about you, the city. Uh, I think what you were getting at was the two party thing. The city and the rec department would be considered yes. one party. Yeah. One party, yes. yes. Just for clarification. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Did you have anything, Kevin? Did you want to? No. So, what do we decide with that third party game? Are we going to call them applicants or third party? To... I, I just don't know how you address that. I mean, if it's a. It's just, just events policy covers it. You don't have to, I don't think you have to specify who it's going to be. No, I, I mean, for the people that are requesting it, like where it says third party, instead of third party, you just say the applicant. Yeah. I think that would address any, anything in board and future. Maybe the, maybe the confusion too is if the rec department comes to the council um, on occasion and asks permission to do things. And so I guess when I think of the two parties, I think of the council and the rec department. So this, you know, when we're asking permission, we wouldn't necessarily, this is irrelevant to the rec department's events. So that's where it being a third party event. That's, I guess, yeah. that's, what, but that's the other issue. I think most of those addressed municipal events. Most of the ones I looked at had a section on municipal, nonprofit, and profit. So it broke it out as different entities when they applied, when they put their application in. And we're not really breaking that out. We're not, this doesn't really break out. Is it a for-profit, is it a nonprofit, or is it the city? You know, we have, I know the city, if you went to the city plan and you looked at the rec department, and I don't know how many of those events are still valid that are in the city plan. And I recognize that the city does sponsor a ton of events <coughs> for the community. And um, 
So, so I guess that's kind of where my thought process too. And when we consider the city's contribution to recreation, you know, we think of these third, this third party or these external events, people that come in and they want to host their recreational opportunity. So, you know, the city sometimes gets a bad rap because we don't do anything for the recreation or we don't want to have all these events. Well, the taxpayer is already making a contribution to these events. They're making a contribution to the tune of three hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars and thirty. Three hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars annually to recreation, and that is allowing that money. Those taxpayer dollars are being entrusted to a rec department that has the qualifications to deliver safe events. We are stewards to the property and the resources of the city, and we have an understanding of the liability and the loss control perspective to keep the city's best interests. We have that at heart. So. All of that money already is being spent on annual events, and if we're looking to have more annual events in town, there are ways to make that happen by qualified individuals that already have a pretty good understanding of how that works. And, and when you have, say we have a rec department, we do what we have you, and you're the only one reviewing now because we don't have a rec committee. We really have to have a rec committee that can assist with this, so it isn't like one person is making all the decisions on what comes over your desk, that you have a sounding board other than the council to get a feel for what you need. But in fact, we, we, we appointed a rec committee. Are they active? <laughs> no. No, but we appointed a rec committee. So yeah, when people say we don't have a rec committee, we do have a did, rec committee. Did those people come in here and say, I want to volunteer? No. We looked at the list from the year before. And we appointed him. Just called so, so to me, that's not creating a rec committee. But just called him. There is a certain degree of work that would go into making that happen, especially given the fact that we can't find the bylaws. It's a whole other project in and of itself. And I agree 110% that we need to have a revitalized committee to help with those things. But we, the purpose of the rec committee, I see as being the community's voice back towards the recreation department, which is also the role of the city council members. So if whether or not we have a specialized recreation committee to field all of those things, you guys are also the primary place. So the committee, the community is entrusting you guys to make those decisions, knowing that the recreation committee that we have right now, I, I could have put this out to them, and maybe maybe I should, but um, they are so inactive that they probably would say, "Yep, this looks good," and they they don't necessarily have the qualifications to to understand where this is coming from. You guys do. Well, one thing to add is what Jess's job is. So Jess is interacting with people on a daily basis. And you get um, how many dozens of requests a year. And they're taking on a certain pattern and there's a certain uh, track that they go on. You're, you're producing this policy not only based on the research that you've done, but also on what you see as the needs and the trends and the questions that you're being asked. So it's not like this is something that's coming out of left field. This is based on research, based on what you've experienced after a full year on the job, that you even had exposure to it before when you were supervisory capacity. So this, this brings you a tool that you need in here and now. You also have at least six pending requests waiting in the wings that if there's not a policy that's available to them, that pulls them forward, that educates them, that, that helps you do your job, um, that helps them decide whether or not they're going to come back next year so that we can plan better than um, we're right back where we were before. So there is some need. Um, we can easily change the third party title tonight on this draft. Um, you might want to try it for a period of time to see how it goes. But I, I really think there's tools in here that will serve the recreation department well and will also serve, serve the consumer well so they have guidance. Dan, also you had a uh, question earlier about the difference between nonprofit and profit. It's actually one of the first things that they are asked on the application, uh, okay. whether it's for personal, nonprofit, for profit. <coughs> Or on the application, they get the application. With, they will get this when the policy is developed. The policy <coughs> will go through the application, just like all the rest of the policy stuff is. So they will hopefully have all of that up front and understand what they're asking. And, and you know what? To be honest with you, 
when, when these requests come in, they are not um, as savvy as you may think. Many of them ask for my assistance with all of the planning aspects, and that's another reason why it's important for us to sift through the credible versus the non-credible requests because the number of email exchanges or phone call exchanges or in-person visits that come along with every single one of these is extremely exhausting and that in itself, depending on their abilities and their experience and their understanding of how to plan an event can be exhausting and very time consuming. So, um, yeah, so that's it. It's an important thing and yes, I, I do feel like I have some qualifications to be able to help usher people this and many of them are not put off by this in fact they seek out more information about when they come in and make their presentation to council they want to know what you're looking for and they want to know what to say because they have no idea so this is not a this is not meant to be restrictive this is meant to give them some guidelines and I'm going to tell you even if this was to be put into place I'm still going to continue to answer many questions and when it gets to the very end and it says that they have to come in and make a, a presentation to you they're going to ask me what to do whether we have it in here or not any of them are going to ask me. There are very few that are savvy enough and experienced enough to, to host an event and do all these things without additional help. Well, I would really like to hear from the public, but I realize we haven't made a motion yet. Um, I wonder if we might consider bending the rules so that the public could give input before we consider making a motion. Oh, Mr. Mayor. If we need to make a motion, uh, I would make a motion that we accept the policy as written, uh, try it for one year, revisit it next year, uh, and in the meantime, see what works and what doesn't work so that at the end of the year, we can come back and say this this has proved to be helpful or this has, has not proved to be helpful. Motion's been made. Is there a second to that motion? Motion. Made and seconded. Now we can open it up for discussion. Before I open up to everybody, I just wanted to give a little history. I'm the one who actually requested a policy because for all my years on here, it was kind of, I would have to say to term haphazard. We didn't even have an application. Just created an application for events. It used to be people would just come into the council. I want to hold an event, and I wanted something like a, a checklist. And so she came up with the application, and then I said, "Well, we need to go farther with the policy because the application I didn't think was working well enough." So that's some of the history um, as far as that goes. And so they've come up with this policy. Um, I like the idea of trying it for a year. If I had my druthers, um, now that we've had time to reflect, I wouldn't recommend we put any money towards a, an event. Someone asked me what does St. Albans do? So I checked. St. Albans puts absolutely no tax dollars towards an event. They, they provide support services. They provide the police, the fire, and all that. But as far as people coming in and asking for actual tax dollars, they don't do that. They provide the underlying support, but they budget for it. And that's one thing we have to remember, too. We have not, we already, as just says, we have $300,000 rec department, but we have never budgeted an item in each department for events. Some people say, well, the police work. Well, we have a, a, a thing coming up <coughs> later on tonight that's going to require police. But, what happens if they're tied to that event that the request for? I'll say it's yearly childhood parade. Okay, we've committed the on-duty officers to that event. All of a sudden, they're called to a, a domestic dispute. They all have to go. So that event, so we actually have to have extra people on duty. People may not think that. And so I think having a policy is a good idea. Well, and I think that monetary piece, you know, if, it, if council wants to consider putting an event line in there, that's the, that's the best, most transparent way to ask the taxpayers, do you want to fund these events? Unfortunately for us, in order to budget that, we're looking into October and November, and then it won't hit until FY1920. But the bottom line is, if you're making a fiscal donation, monetary donation, it has to come out of a line somewhere, and those things are all unbudgeted at this point. If you wanted to look at that, that's a whole other thing that can be looked at in November and October, and that was actually, I think, one of the suggestions that Andrea had for Wednesday on the waterfront. And then, 
And that, then you can ask them, what does the community really want? And that's a time where they can really voice their opinion on that. But hiding it and sweeping it under the cover, under the uh, rug of all the other budgets, I don't think is something that's in the best interest of the taxpayers. And then there was a question on the certificate of insurance. That's something that the council has always required. We've, we've always required a certificate of insurance because I use an analogy. If I have a cigarette boat high speed race on the lake and I'm under the city's insurance and I've done a haphazard organization and then there's a massive crash, the city shouldn't be liable. It should be the organizer of the event who should be the liable. And I can tell you that our insurance company would, be, would uh, be very reluctant to take on events that are not internally hosted, where we don't have those stewards of the, and loss control, people that are, have the best, city's best interest. If we were to ask the LCT to take on a third party event where there's no staff members there to put any sort of control or parameters around what's going to happen, I, I don't think that would happen for our insurance carrier. So to incorporate them under the city's insurance without anyone there to supervise it. It's very common is what I'm finding. I can tell you through the centennial uh, planning of it. Uh, it's required that in order for us to issue a, a check to uh, these vendors, they have to supply an MOU, they have to supply a W-9, and they have to supply a certificate of insurance or a hold harmless uh, agreement. We can't even issue the check without it. So it's very commonplace. And with that, um, I'll open up the comments. <coughs> The first name is Paula Cody. Oh. I, I didn't know when you were asking, so I put my hand up to get on the list. <laughs> oh, um, well, since we're going to have a vote, I pretty much open up to everybody. <coughs> so, but Paula Cody, I'm going to go on the list first, just for the. Yeah. I'm assuming you wanted to speak to the event policy. Um, hi, I'm fine. I'm just listening right now. Okay. She thought it was a sign in sheet. <laughs> oh. oh, okay then. Um, Margarita Brown, it's the same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Colleen, you wanted to speak to the event, or you know, you had the garden. Uh, well, both. I, I'd be happy to make a comment on this. Um, I would say that, like, if there will be a policy. Will it, I, mean, I want to ask, will it be enforced consistently across the board? Um, because I also have noted that Wednesdays on the waterfront got an allocation of $2,000, $1,000 from this year's budget and $1,000 from next year's budget. And so I just want to see equity because there are a lot of uh, community groups that don't have money um, and don't, might not have a certificate of insurance. And I think that that is really important that the city is amenable to supporting community members who would like to gather or hold events that increase community resilience. Um, that's it. Thanks. Okay. The next is Lisa Dago Farney. Hi, yes. Um, I'm just here to ask that we're, we are going to be having the early childhood parade hopefully on May 5th and we'd like to request that the fee be waived. Well, that's, a, no, that's an agenda item. Oh, okay. Well, I just want to say that that's a, that's a really wonderful event that's gone on for years, and um, the last couple of years we've had over 500 participants, and I think it's a great, great event for the community, for children and families. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Diane? Well, it's not really clear to me who the policy applies to, does it apply to any event on pub that involves public property? Or does it apply to only events of a certain size? And what's the cutoff? Right. For, for example, if the Girl Scouts wanted to set up a card table at Gardner Park and sell cookies, would they have to have a million dollars of insurance? So that's so what is, what, it's nowhere spelled out what the cutoff is for, dating, for this policy to apply. So there is actually, um, there is a frequently asked questions um, portion of the application that says, do I really need an application? And it has the criteria. If you're expecting 20 people or more, if it's a regularly scheduled, repeating thing that's happening in one of the parks, and if you're, the biggest one is if you're expecting exclusive use. 
So somebody that's going to set up um, a card table and sell Girl Scout cookies, well, they have to do a vendor permit, but that's a whole separate thing. If somebody wanted to have a wedding at the park and they wanted no one else to be around, then they, they would obviously have to submit an application. Um, if the Girl Scouts, that wouldn't really work for that one. But, um, so there is, there is criteria there. So if you were ever coming to the city and you were even entertaining the thought of that, the first place that you would look, which is the application, would should answer those questions for so you. So it doesn't make any difference whether the city contributes any money to it or not. So that's the, not related. The current policy that we're looking at is only for events that are requesting fees to be waived or pay or, or donation from oh. the city. So, so any event that wanted to come in and pay for the field use and do the normal routine of things right. are not subject to this policy. What if you were asking to have a portion of a, a street like a dead end street closed off for three hours during the day? That probably would involve some expense to the city maybe because the police might have it, to come the police and put up a barricade. Yeah, and that would be a separate thing for the police department to work on. So that would not require this policy? It's not a public park. No, we don't have a rate necessarily or anything like that. Street. No. <laughs> street. No. Okay. If, I could, if I could just yeah. interject on that. We have had a situation before where um, I think it was the United Christian Academy asked for a block party. And they did go through our process and it turned out to be quite helpful because basically what ended up happening is the fire department weighed in and they said, here's what you need to be mindful of if there's a fire call, you know, we need to have these things attended to. Them. <coughs> Jamie's not here tonight, um, he could speak to that with a little more clarity, but that's the kind of situation where you have to plan ahead for but does the emergencies. Apply to that? I think that they filled that policy out last year. They, is what I want to say. They did do the application, but there is no fees associated right. with the street. Um, there's fees associated with um, hiring the police department to do some traffic control if that was your need, yeah. but there's no like field use fee for a street or anything like that. These so are just there would for be other regulations that would apply, but not this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Hey. Um, Penny Thomas, did you want to go? Did you want to wait? I'll wait, it, as long as I can speak. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Pam? How does this work with the farmer's market? Does the farmer's market come under this policy? Because you brought it up last time at the meeting, and, and it was sort of with a, a really hefty fee attached to it, which would drive the farmer's market straight out of here. Yeah. That would be tragic. Yep. Mr. Mayor. Um, they, so that would be up to the council. They would have to entertain the, the, um, the events that are currently happening and weigh out what the community benefit is. I also want to remind the council that there are options where you can make alternate arrangements. So there was the softball teams, for example, that couldn't aff the Little League that couldn't afford to have their fields paid for, but they offered up some in-kind labor and some, some um, stuff to the park to help balance out the cost of what their field dues should be. A farmer's market can, can, could consider a commission type thing. Uh, they do make a hundred dollar donation, or if so, the council so wishes, they could make that an ex the one time grandfathered an exception, or however you guys would like to deal with that. Um, there's that that would be up to you. So, I'm sorry, you sort of lost me with that. You're explaining that it's really hard for us in the peanut gallery to hear. There's, there's, there's no amplification, and the room is full. So if the, if the farmers market has what it worked out, whatever arrangement they have worked out with you. That you're saying can be changed at the whim of the council? Well, technically this policy gives room that council can decide based on a few different factors what they wish. This just so, gives us a baseline frame. Okay. We don't want to, I don't think that it's the council's intent or our intent or anyone's intent to chase out things like the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. We all know that there's value there. So to, what this policy is doing is encouraging that there is a mutual benefit or that there is a working together that we're happy what's happening is that we're working together or if the council wishes to say you know what they've had it this way for so long we've seen it's a proven benefit to the community that's that's so who would set the actual fee the rec department or the council the rec department has fees already based on the usage standard fees that apply for anyone for doing for that space that the farmers market sits in Council can decide whether they want to waive or you know grant portion or however they want to do that. So somebody from the farmers market would have to come in here, first get on the agenda, make a sales pitch. So that it's it's something really complicated. <coughs> So in Judy's case, we've already started the conversation with her. I'm just using this best as an example. Yeah, but it's a good example. And um, Judy's come in a couple of times. We've actually had very productive conversations. The conversation is not over by any stretch of the imagination. 
and obviously she's interested to see how this goes. We were um, reassuring to Judy, we want the farmer's market to stay there, we want to find a happy medium. We've got to make some improvements down there, we've got to give the um, physical area some attention. It's, the conversation isn't over, but it certainly opens the opportunity to work together. I think we have, we have common desires when it comes to that. That's Can I interject? A lot of the, the cost, this, the well, PAS Council asked for this cost analysis to be done. It wasn't just done by the Rec Department. The PAS Council mm -hmm. asked for this because they saw the burden on all the services. And so I, I commend all the department heads for coming up with what it truly costs for all these events. It doesn't, and it doesn't cost the department heads, it costs the taxpayers what it costs for these events. And so um, that, the farmer's market pays, what, $100 a year, and they've been doing that for 20 years probably, right? Yeah, they give a $100 donation. For, right, $100 for 20 years. And so um, that, is, I mean, at least they're, they're donating, the way I look at it, the farmer's market's a great asset to the community, and so it would be the discretion of the council. But we all know that $100 a year only covers one trash pickup <laughs> down there. And because the MAC has to spend time after every farmer's market picking up the trash that's blown out of the trash can and the seagulls, and, you know, that's Wednesdays and Saturdays. So there is all that cost that we are bearing, um, that the city taxpayers are bearing. And so when it comes to these fees and costs, it wasn't that just, just came up with them, the council had asked for them. And these were all based off of the approved rates. So. The approved recreation right. rates. Yeah. It's just a calculation of the time. Right. Okay. Other question? Uh, Robin, and then we'll go to Jen. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was reading this is that it's, it, it's kind of confusing, actually. Um, if you can solve the third party thing, I didn't, I didn't understand that either. It seems like you're talking about an independent event, an event independent of the city. That would clear that up. Um, and then there's, there, there's things like, like, I'm not really sure, like how do you know, um, what's the, subs under the policy, What's the substantial return on investment measured by economic inca uh, impact or other tangible events? I mean, is there an example of that? Uh, how is somebody going to look at that and make that decision in advance of an event? Do you know what I mean? So uh, if I was an organizer and I looked at this, I would have, I, th I wonder if it might create more questions than it answers. It. If it was tightened up in wording, it might solve some of your back and forth, it just, just as a reader. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to ask about, and the council can address this, it talks about limiting, and I'm not going to find it now because I just read it, that there's only one sponsorship per year. It says will, and that it's like a distinctive thing. I, I, that doesn't leave the council any decision chance to change that. I didn't. I don't know where that is now. I've read it and read it again. <laughs> Robin, that's at the top of the page. page two. <coughs> Which one? Page two? Yes, the very last sentence. Yes, only one city sponsor sponsorship bleh, ship will be awarded to an organization per fiscal year. So I, I don't know, like, what does that mean? And why is there a limit? And also, do have you ever listed like all the different organizations to get some support they pay their fees we have six groups waiting in the wings that have to have this does the council have that information and can you share it because i don't remember hearing those names of organizations that are lined up so these are all of the requests that we got last year for our parks okay. the, the folks that did did pay the folks that did not pay are listed on this sheet. So anything that's not on that sheet paid without question. Okay. Um, so we could go through and get a list of those, but what we've done is the opposite. We've got a list of those who didn't. Um, who didn't pay. Yeah. yeah. So those are the ones you're going to face again next year. Yes. 
Okay. Well, potentially. So yeah. may not. Um, so to address your other two questions, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, one sponsorship per year. So what, what could potentially happen is we have an organization that um, wants to come, they want to host, you know, five events throughout the year, which is great. What we're asking administratively is that they put all of those requests into one um, council request or council meeting. They, they may be able to host multiple events or have a series of events like Wednesdays on the Waterfront. If Wednesdays on the Waterfront were to come and make a request for every single Wednesday that they had, that would be a lot of administrative time put into that. It would okay. be a lot of requests to come so before you, So council. you're not saying event, you're saying or <coughs> one per organization, yes, I think which is not exactly... Only, only one city sponsorship will be awarded to an organization. Okay. It, does, it doesn't limit the number of events they can have. Okay. Um, and then the, la the other question you had was about um, uh, the item, a tangible or is it? Um, yeah, it's under policy about the third or the fifth one down. <laughs> It's the second to the last under policy. You'd think after all the time I've had my eyes on this, I know. Go by the back well, I apologize for wandering <laughs> myself. No, I tried okay. to Note to self, I need to put numbers on things. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a substantial return on investment. So this was a really tough one for us to put into language because you understand the concept of recreation improving the quality of life in our community, right? Everyone understands that concept. So how do we quantify that? How do we say that one event over another is better for our community or um, reaches the most people? You know, an event that has 25 people in attendance, does that have the same impact on the quality of life as an event that reaches 500 or is open to all ages versus a targeted demographic? So we, we had a really hard, we all understand that that improves the quality of life of a community, but how do we say that that is what we're looking for when an event comes forward? Um, so that was our best way to capture that. Uh, it's not an easy thing to put into words because you can't quantify the quality of life. Um, I think a really good example of that when we were struggling with the right sentences and words and verbs was um, Wednesdays on the Waterfront is a really good example of something that is free and accessible to all. And um, that was something that had what we could tell, the feedback we got from Andrea and Vero is that it had an economic impact because the restaurants were full during their events. So that seems like something that would be beneficial in general, tangible. Um, conversely, we have events, uh, we have some of the requests on there that are less accessible to all. Um, they might have um, an inclusive picnic, for example, where they're not encouraging their uh, participants to go to the restaurants. Um, again, it's, it's, we have such a, a cross gamut and diverse um, requests that are coming in here. We're trying to make, it, to make it so that if it's taxpayer supported, the taxpayers get something back. If you're an event organizer and you're coming and you're making a request and asking for support, whether it be from the com from the city, the community's people, if you're if you're looking for buy-in, or whether you're going for private sponsorships from businesses, you're very well versed in um, the return on investment. See, so those are the statements like this is going to be great for businesses because everyone's going to go to their restaurants, or this is good for our families because mom and kids, it's, it's open to all ages, it's appealing to all ages, so the family unit can go. Those are the, the five minute elevator speeches, the merit behind what you're doing. And that was our, the best way that we could put that in there. If it didn't, uh, if okay. I may, can I just, it, if it didn't come to mind, then it maybe doesn't get what you're just reading it. Right. Yeah, I, I figured there was some kind of, some kind of equation that somebody would know, but it's more esoteric. Yeah, there's no real equation. Yeah. You so you're looking theory. for, give us your top three reasons that this is going to benefit downtown economics. Yes. And they'll say, oh, every rest, restaurant's full or something, and that'll be, I don't know, there's yeah. a, a way to figure it out. So thank you. Um, you were talking about this is for larger events or whatnot. Um, at the park is basically where it's supposed to be. Memorial Day, which is a very large event. Um, how does that work into it and quantify for cost and whatnot? Because with 
veterans and all that is that worked into the budget seeing which it's a touchy subject as in they've already paid their dues and how does that cost work into it with the taxpayers and whatnot are they paying are they part of your waiver fee and do they have to do all this to be able to hold their services at the park and stand on the grass around the monument that's been there you know so I was just wondering if you can answer that question. So that's a really tough one and that's why the rec department chose to take themselves out of it because whether or not the veterans parade or the children's day parade should be chosen one over the other is all up for personal interpretation. Everyone's opinion is different. Someone else may think that the children's parade ought to be free because they're a bunch of youngsters and you gotta pull up their bootstraps and pay for it themselves. Probably their not. booty straps. Their booty straps. So you know uh, uh, before you finish that, veterans and children are totally different. We wouldn't be in this room if it weren't for the veterans. That's your opinion, but children, No, that's true. Wouldn't, wouldn't that's true. If you weren't a child either at one point. In your but life, no, so. the, we would be under Nazi rule, Japanese rule, still under British rule. Well, I don't if think anyone's for the, questioning that. No, that no, that no, is no what my that, point. But, yeah. but no, anyway. no one's questioned that at all. No. <laughs> that, that's so, a little bit different. No, that's no, 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 Robin, you've gone already. And so the cost yeah, to stand on that grass is the same for everyone because nobody wants to stand in a field of uncut lawn. Okay. So. That's where the fees come from, and that's why they're standard across the way. So they have to be paid for it's somewhere along the line. But don't we pay for that already by having a rec department and paying the taxes to be able to have a public park when we have a rec department that already does that? So this is where it gets a little bit hairy. And again, this is not. I'm just asking. I'm not yeah, trying to put you on the spot. It's not an easy answer, and that's what that's the challenge that council has lied ahead, lying ahead. The bottom line is that these the grass has to be cut by someone and, and when we have a recreation department our job for us to say no to one versus another these are all public events and they all have their own benefits so that is, I, I guess the best answer I have for that is good luck that's a tough decision that you have to make. That doesn't answer the question she's asking him about but are these things already compensated in somewhere else? Well let, just a second let me know let me just say please. Um, if you're going to, if people want to speak, I'd like to have you raise your hand, please, so I can acknowledge you and call on you. Um, the way I look at it, a little differently. I look at Fourth of July. I look at Memorial Day. I look at Veterans Day as civic events. Civic events. I look at the veterans, and they all served, and I look at it that way. The other events I look as external events, in a way. Right. I think every community is responsible for the civic events. Mm -hmm. Civic events meaning, your, like I said, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, um, Fourth of July. I can't think. Those that I look at as civic events. And the, every community usually is responsible for that. That's the way I look at it myself. That's just me. That's just how I look at it. Jim and then Lori. I can comment on the veterans stuff. Um, Memorial Day and Veterans Day and Memorial Day been going on in the community for as older than I am, probably. I won't say older. <laughs> we fill out an application, the American Legion, every year. Every year the council is waiting to be. Uh, veterans group have a very hard time just staying alive. Because younger people don't want to have anything to do with this. They're all older fellas. And they get <coughs> Uh, membership was dropping every year and speaking for the American Legion you know we, we take in just enough money to keep that building open and serve with a few veterans patronize it we can't afford to pay all this stuff and you know like I said it's been going on for 50 60 years we fill out the application they always waive the fee and we're grateful for it because we have paid our dues you're right and I don't think that this is a policy where we can restrict we can make hard line restrictions. There's always, no matter what policy you have, there's always going to be you know, exceptions. The best thing we can do is to generalize and the board of the most part. All right, and then So, so um, I think if I understand really what you're saying, Jess, is here's a policy, here's the application. If you're having an event, of a certain size or whatever the situation is, you need to fill this stuff out. Once that's done, once things are approved, really, 
I think where you're, we're going with this latest discussion is once all that happens, it's really up to these people here to decide whether the fee is waived or not. And they can waive every fee all year long if they choose to. Is that what you're saying? That is absolutely right. Okay. So I have three questions and then a comment. Am I going to be able to get through them or am I going to, should I? Okay. So my first question is, um, is this a policy of the rec department, the rec committee, or the city council? This is a council policy. It's a policy that is being recommended by the rec department and the city manager to the city council for approval. So if you approve it, it will become a policy of the city council? Yes, okay. of the city. Of, of the city. Um, so one of the concerns that I just heard was that um, in sort of um, letting you all breathe a little easier that you're not going to get a whole bunch of applications across your desk, the rec department has told you that they're going to filter which ones make it to you. And I just think that, that that's an area that um, not isn't in this policy, but I think is an area that could use a little bit more attention just because um, you know, if there's people making the decision that aren't accountable to the public. So you are elected people, and you're making a decision up or down on a, on an application. You get people get to you're you're held accountable by the voters. But the rec department, as I understand it, is not a voted in position. And so there's just some concern that comes in there with um, the people making the decision being accountable to the city. Um, my second question is about: Is this about approving whether or not an event can occur in the city, or is this about approving? whether or not the fees would get waived for an event. These fees would get waived for an event. This is just for the fees being waived. Any event can come through the process and help and be hosted in the city. And you said, when were those rates set? When were these rates set? Where did these rates come from? Set, they're uh, set annually, September of every year at the city council meeting. We bring, we bring forth the, the rates and have them. And are they public somewhere? Yes, they're, they're on every application you would ever see. So before you even submit your thought for an event, you see them up front. Um, so my third question is, where is the city council budget um, or the rec department budget also public somewhere? Mm -hmm. They itemize budget. So, and does it have line items for things like, for some of these same things? There's no line item for what I consider a third party event. So any, the, the money that we have for annual events in our budget, the actual dollars that are in there are for recreation department events. So when we host the Halloween events or when we host the egg hunts or things like that, those are accounted for there. There's no extra money set aside for others that want to come in and host an event. And where is there a description of um, the role of the rec department? And you, I heard you say, you know, you believe as mayor that these are part of the civic duty of the city. Um, but there's others not. So is there anywhere in writing within the job description of the individuals within the rec department or within the mission of the rec department as a whole that outlines some of those pieces of what is held by the rec committee and what is considered outside or third party? So um, one place to look is our annual report and our budget. It's posted on our um, website <coughs> that gives some outlines about the responsibilities of the rec department. It also, um, the, the report that is written each year gives um, uh, the taxpayer an idea of what, what they're accountable for as well, the things that they're measuring. So I should have introduced myself at the beginning. I'm Martha Braithwaite, and I've helped the last few years with um, coordinating the Building Bright Futures Parade for the Young Child. And I'm not a Newport City resident. I'm just here in the capacity of trying to make sure that an event that's happened in our community for a long time um, can continue. And But if I did live in Newport, um, I'd be pretty insulted tonight um, about the way that the tone that's coming from the table about the, pop about the citizenry of Newport City. And, when I hear things like unqualified, when I hear things like the people who have the city's best interest at heart are only the staff of the city, first I get insulted. <laughs> um, I've been planning events since I was this big, um, literally um, events with 20,000 people at the Brent Puppet Theater. Um, I don't have a degree as an event planner. I do have a degree in public policy. Um, but so that first, the first, my first reaction to those comments was just to feel personally insulted. But then my heart kind of broke because while I really recognize the need for competent public administration, 
Um, when I hear things like people are unqualified or the citizens who are trying to plan events in their neighborhoods don't have the best interests of the city at heart, what I feel like is at risk here, what I feel like is on the line, is our, our state's history of self-government. And I'm sorry that I'm getting a little emotional about this, but, but we're a state that believes in self-government. We have select boards. Um, and so I really appreciate this need for some competence in public administration and some planning and some budgeting, but I would really caution and really beg you to think about the other side of that coin of are we closing doors to civic participation and are we closing doors to um, really developing the leadership and, and living up to our history of a government for the people and by the people. Right on. I, I'd like to respond to that if I may. Uh, when I read that, particular uh, principle, the events will be evaluated to determine the impact on daily activity and whether it's in the city's best interest. I was thinking more of events like if somebody came and said, we want a white supremacist KKK march up through Main Street to Newport, that's not in the city's best interest. Um, obviously, uh, children parades, uh, veteran parades, these are not only in the city's best interest, but they're in the public's best interest. Uh, so I, I guess I, I wasn't looking at it as, as saying, you know, everybody that comes in, wow, are we going to benefit from the city? I was looking at it, is it going to cause turmoil in the city and not necessary strife? Is there something that as a city we should support? Can I, can I just respond to his response? Um, real quick, because I want to make I just think the key phrase, the key for there is who decides. Who gets to decide if something's controversial? That's what I want who to gets answer. to decide? It does and that's the concern is if it's one, and I'm sorry not to put you on the spot, but if that's one person, I just, I hear the, what you raised about the lack of a committee, um, and that this just, the, the a, a really robust policy that makes for a thriving, healthy city and makes for um, lots of hands make light work, right? Mm -hmm. So the more people that we can involve in a real meaningful way, and sometimes in the interest of okay, crossing I's and dotting T's, we shut doors to participation. No, we're not shutting any doors to participation. The Red Committee, and the other uh, Red Committee, the Red Department for 40 years has been planning events and outside events. The council hires a Red Director, we hire a City Manager. We have to put our faith in those people, and if someone comes in with an event and, and, they, and they're not happy with the response from Jess or even the City Manager, they can come to the City Council. We've had that happen. So no one is shutting the door on anything. We just have to have a filter of what gets approved and what doesn't. I mean, or what event, probably getting tongue-tied a little bit, but what event. We have to have faith in the people we hire. We hire Jess as the rec director, and she knows her facilities. She's here day in, day out. They do the daily operations of this community, and that's what I just wanted to say, that I have faith in and our rec director. I have faith in our city staff. And Mr. Ross, did you want to say something? When, when I look at Jess, she has a very hard job. And I think if, if you would listen carefully, she doesn't push anybody aside. Her, her main role is if somebody comes in, she's there to help them. And it's no different than the zoning administrator. His job is to help people through the process. Her job is to help people through the process. Now, because I have gray hair, I've been dealing with different administrations for I don't know how many years. And I've always found if I come in to talk to the city manager, I come in to talk to the gentleman in the back that's sleeping, no, he's awake. <laughs> but anytime I've come in and I've asked for some help, and it's not because they think I'm stupid because I can't do it, I don't, I don't know everything. You know, and most people coming in need that help. People don't know everything. And they need somebody there to help them through the process. And I have to put my faith in the fact that when we hire somebody, they're going to help people through that process. Um, so people are, people no, no, I'm cutting you me. off now, ma'am. I'm cutting you off because I've got to go to other people. Okay, but no, people no, I'm, no, no, I'm cutting you off now. Ma'am, I'm cutting you off now. We have to go to other residents, residents of the city and other people who wish to speak.
Um, Jennifer, and then I'm going to go to Penny. Uh, quick question. What is your definition of a large event? What is your saying that applies to large events? So on the initial application, the very first field use application, there's a threshold. It's either 100 people or more gets that second one, or anything that's a special event, so something that alters the pattern of traffic, or something that might require uh, emergency personnel, so police department or fire department. That, that's delineated pretty clearly in all the applications. Okay. And, and one other, if I can. Uh, you have a thing that says you must have the liability coverage. Uh, but I believe the city manager said that they could sign at least the centennial hold harmless clause. If so, should that must be should in the policy? This must means there's no flexibility. Should means they could, you could accept something else. I think the hold harmless clause is for folks that were paying. Yeah, that's the difference. So those are for um, money that the city is <coughs> not those that are coming. So you are going to require the insurance program. Yes, yeah, and there's another option that a lot of people, do, they won't know until they ask, mm -hmm. um, but there's a, there's a tenant user liability insurance program. It's a long name, TULIP for short. People that are mom and pop shops or mm -hmm. folks that are not under a larger organization can go to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, which is our insurance carrier, and request this <coughs> one time for event purposes. There's actual insurance that is for this type of thing. There's a fee, I think it's like $75 or something. And that will be for coverage, million. and it will cover them for their one-time event on a certain day at a certain time. Um, so there is that option for people. So a lot of people that think, you know, they may think that that's unreachable, there are ways that they can get that if they don't have that. You must have that, that would be something that I would help them with. <laughs> In the application, you might be quick too. That's it. Okay. Penny. Penny Thomas. Tonight our counselors will vote on an events policy and what will happen, we don't know. I didn't know what would happen when my marriage dissolved and I had to leave my Seymour Lake home. Starting over at age 60, now eight years ago. I came to an abandoned house on Mount Vernon Street just up the hill from here. Maybe you saw it choked behind the weeds and the rubbish and the brush. It's different there now. It's a yellow frame with, with green shutters. There are gardens in the front, blackberry patch in the back, and a split rail fence. Paul, you, you've been there. You, you came as mayor to a celebration on the porch <coughs> for the flower baskets, remember? Uh, Julie and Dennis and Michelle and Dawn have been there for a Renew Port Events Task Force meeting in my living room. Home for me is safe and warm and orderly and caring and welcome. And I'm a ruler of my own castle, unafraid, confident with those I love. How would you describe what home is to you? <coughs> Newport is my home, our home. We've been through a lot here uh, at home lately. We have a hole in our center. We have drug addictions. We have businesses closing. Our Cider House Grill is on the verge, and I just learned that they're asking for $10,000 to stay open. We struggle here in Newport. We struggle for vibrancy here at home, for life. And it's not easy here, is it? But we are resilient. <coughs> Spring is coming, and we will be here for another 100 years. What we do now is a catalyst for a new Newport, an updated home. 
Tonight we are here, counselors. We'll vote. And we will learn tonight what welcome means in Newport. All of us have chosen to show up tonight. And we've shown up for years. And we work hard. The council works hard. You put your hearts and souls into making Newport a place to call home. Jessica and Laura have spent untold hours writing a policy to be fair and welcoming to all. Julie works for our health, Kevin for our safety, Dan for our school, and Paul Mayer. You strive every day to make Newport a home full of life. We work to repair our holes. We persevere. We don't give up, even when we've been knocked down. Together, we will find courage in one another and hope in solidarity. Not to take pot shots at one another. We look beyond this cold, windy, dark April night to events in the warm sunshine. Oh Lord, let it be. So now we are here. What will we create for our events at home? We haven't had an events policy for a hundred years. And the events policy before us has only been public for a few hours. Could, let's hold on for six weeks rather than put something in writing right now that we will live with for a year. Let's, let's give ourselves some space together to create the space we need so we don't fall into an unexpected hole somewhere. The events policy before us has merit. It strives for fairness and welcome. But there are questions, as we've heard tonight, about the policy that create uncertainty and things that are not clear. I know that there are events waiting in the pipeline to be approved. And it's important to have a policy in effect. Yes, it is. However, we've been approving events for the past year, my understanding is, with guidelines, although <coughs> unwritten, so that we can have events. Counselors, please vote to give us a bit more time to get our events policy right. This is too important to hurry. Councillor Dan, I, I will echo your sentiments that this is a policy that deserves input from us. Jess is doing it by herself. And we do need a functioning rep committee. The people who create events have not had a chance to comment on this policy. It came out this morning, let's be a city where people talk with each other, give us a chance to make suggestions on the policy before it is written. It will create a sense of buy-in and cooperation between our city government and our citizens. Please give us a direct voice in what we want to do for fun here in our downtown. This policy is a welcome mat to our home here in Newport that sets the tone for the next 100 years for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, and our visitors. Can't we wait for a few weeks until Jessica and Laura 
can write bylaws for the rep committee by April's end. Michelle, Dan, Penny, Bruce, Melody, Denise have volunteered to serve on the rep committee and Jessica has that list. This is a new rep committee that James was saying earlier, the rep committee used to do everything in terms of raising funds and, and uh, helping with events. And the Re Newport Events Task Force, for which I'm chair, we are, we are vibrant. We've met two or three times. We are, we are ready and willing. I see you looking at the clock, and I'm I, 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 about 30 more seconds. So the task force, the REC task force, can look at the policy and make comments. Counselor Julie and Counselor uh, Dennis are there. We need to make the time to make sure we are clear, transparent, and accountable. And there have been a lot of questions about these, this policy. There are people who are willing to step up to make sure we welcome events and are crystal clear about what the ground rules are for our events so that it's not confusing. There are people in Newport who have new energy at home here in Newport, so counselors. I respect and admire you for all you have done, are doing, and will do for us. I do ask that you pause with the events policy, take a breath, for a few weeks and give me, us, the opportunity to work together on the actions of the events policy. Thank you. Thank you. Anne, and then Diane, and then if there's, uh, before I go to Diane, after Anne, if there's anyone new before I go to someone for the second time. Anne Shrell, I live in Newport. Um, and here's my concern. Uh, we hired and spent money on an expert who came, White and Burke. White came himself and told us that one of the things this city needed was events. The more events we could have, the better. And over this hundred years, you've done pretty well on uh, letting events in, um, though you have discouraged some. And we've lost the Santa Run, and we lost uh, the Halloween Hustle. And we lost our rent to use, I can't ever get it right. It's the bike ride that came through once, and they moved to Burke, and the Santa Run moved to Barton. Um, if you make the rules so daunting, uh, no matter how much you say you're going to help them, but when you hold up those six packets, the packet looks like this. And we know that in the zoning area, uh, one of the things the city has said over the years is, we, we have a streamlined version. Uh, if you come to Newport to open a business, you can open a business easily on our streamlined version. I forget what we call it, Dan knows. Um, and there should be a streamlined version of an application uh, to do events, because Burke and White, your own experts, said we needed them. Let's not discourage people. We, we've re recently discouraged at least three groups from coming to Newport that I know of. Uh, let's not discourage any more. The more rules you make, the harder you make it, the, the fewer people, the more people will say, hey, we could do this in Derby. I just want to respond to one thing. The Santa Run, we did not have $500 of taxpayers' money in the budget to provide for that event. So the organizer decided not to do it and move somewhere else. But that was taxpayers' money, and the organizer of that event was a for-profit individual. Um, and we didn't have the money. You could have gone to a local business and asked for the money for that event. I mean, there's only so much money in the council budget. And it's taxpayers' money, and when we don't have it in the budget, we don't have it. And sometimes we have to say no. And that is one reason why the council is trying to come up with a policy to make it easier. I mean, if I've, as I said earlier in the meeting, in the very beginning, I think we ought to stop providing taxpayer funds as far as giving you money towards your event. Provide the services, yes, like St. Albans, but giving, writing a check to a group or an organization, I think we should stop doing that. That's just my opinion on that. And as Jess, she put out the application. It doesn't look too thick to me. 
So I just want to clarify, actually, uh, the Santa Run, um, I, d I did a little digging in that. And the Santa Run, three years ago, was hosted in Newport when we did our Santa Festival, and there was a lot of other vibrant um, holiday festivities in town. Santa Run was hosted by Kingdom Games that year. The following year, it did not run in Newport. It didn't run anywhere. This last year, it was run in Orleans, but not by Kingdom Games. It was by a completely different entity. There are Santa Runs that are run all over the country, and just because one isn't happening here and then pops up in Orleans does not mean that somebody had their feelings hurt and moved to Orleans to do that. Um, that just means that folks, there's vibrancy popping up in other communities, and great, how wonderful for them. So uh, the Raspi Tits, I think, has a history of its own. Uh, that came along before we had any application process. Um, there was a big public safety issue because there were thousands of bikers in the street, and the police department and the fire department were not prepared to handle that impact on traffic. So that was, um, that was part of the reason this kind of thing becomes helpful. And just to clarify, there seems to be this really big misconception about the application process. So I'm just going to walk everybody here through this. Front page just talks about all the requirements um, that you have to put in um, your complete application so that we can read it. Um, it's got to be in by a certain date ahead of your event so that we have time to process it. The bottom part talks about what makes a special event. This page talks about don't leave your glass in the park, make sure that your children are supervised, um, please clean up after yourself, uh, the park closes at 10 p.m., D details like that, basic rules and stuff. This is the one page application that folks have to fill out when they want to uh, rent any facility. This tells us what their name is, what their phone number is, what organization they're with, what dates and times that they want to have their event, and a brief, tiny thing that says description of use just so we know what they're doing at our facility. The back page, page is office use only. This is where we record their payment information. The very last page has the fees that everyone um, wants to know about. It also has a frequently asked questions section that answers any frequently asked questions that we typically get when someone applies for our facility. So I'll give you a copy of that so that you have it. If somebody meets the 100 person threshold, they move on to the large event application. This is the, the mysterious 20 to 30 page application that we have. It's really actually just one page front and back, and it says things like you need to have one porta potty for every 150 people, you need to have a medical services plan, an overflow plan, a security plan, things like that, so that we make sure that this, these events are safe for our community and everyone that comes to them. Uh, the second page on this is just the office use only stuff for people. So I'll give you a copy of that too so you have that. Is it online? It is online. Yep. And it's in the racks right outside our office door too. So why are those packets so big? Uh, these are all of the event applications that come through every summer. So each one of those is right here. This is everyone that applies to use our facilities and spaces. I think it would simplify things a lot if you could just have one policy for whether or not you can have an event in Newport on public property. And that event should, and that policy should include all the things that are on the application about uh, all the insurance and all that stuff. Uh, one part A for small events, part B for large events. That would say whether you should even be there putting in an application or not. The second part having to do with fees, well, that seems to be up to the city council. Once you've decided <coughs> that it's okay for this group to have an event, then the city council can decide whether they want to waive the fees or collect them. But <coughs> the, the policy has to do with us, events that involve fees uh, under certain circumstances is very confusing for all of us. And my tendency is to want to say, oh, forget it. I'm just going to hold it on private property because this is too complicated. So uh, why don't you just have one policy that says, in order to have an event in Newport on public policy, we must meet these guidelines, period. And then let them worry about whether they charge the money or not. We have a fee schedule. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions from? I, I, have. Real quick. I, I have questions about. Real uh, quick, because. So, I, so I, I, I'm with uh, Councillor Dennis. I don't understand the need for a nonprofit that directing the just to nonprofits. It, it, I, I, I'm all about bringing people who make money to the city and encouraging them. So I would ask that the council vote to strike that. I have a number of other questions, but I, I don't. I mean, I have a num number of other specific questions about the policy <coughs> itself. And I, I guess what I'm saying is that I really hope you all will give us time to 
ask these questions and not put this in writing. My understanding is that when things go in writing, they're very hard to change. And I'd really like, to, as to, I'd really like some opportunity to help you all with this and, and make some. What, our next uh, Renew Court meeting is Monday night. We could look at this and give you some feedback. Okay. Did you have something? If you have an event down here by the city dock, it's supposed to be state thing. Is that handled if somebody wanted to sell food, or is there a way? Is that being worked on? Because that's state property, the process yeah. is through the state, so we don't have anything. To you don't have anything. Say, uh, for an ask, go through and ask if it could be done, or I think that's a whole separate subject. The board that's a whole separate. Yeah. That's not <coughs> dealing with any of this. Except now, if you had a group that came in, it might be controversial. Who would make the decision on that? I would assume Jess. I'm not saying it'll happen. No, but I'm but. assuming uh, <laughs> if it's real controversial, Jess would come to the council. Okay. Well, no, I don't have a problem with it, but, you know, there's things out there that are getting closer and closer. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Correct. All right. So, <laughs> with all that, we do have a motion on the floor. Mr. Mayor. I do have a ton of questions, but I'm not going to ask them right now. Um, I'd really like to take Penny's suggestion and give it time and give various people to um, allow more public input. Um, I do really appreciate the time that you've spent working on this policy. I'm, I'm sure it has not been much fun. And I also really appreciate being able to hear people tonight. I know it's taken a long time, but I think it's well worth every minute. Okay. But I just like to thank Jess because she did take our input and she worked with it. So she wasn't working blindly by herself. I know I gave her input. I know Kevin gave her input. And I know she incorporated some of that. So I want to thank her for that. And I know they, she answered my question about the, the triangle that were in the end of it. <coughs> we'll go ahead. Uh, results based. The results based. Evidence. I know. I yes. couldn't think of the terminology, but yes, I called it triangles because it was drawn out. I couldn't think of it. But yes. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Um, I know we have a motion before us, and I do realize that part of the motion was that we uh, use this policy and then revisit it a year from now. Um, I would just ask that we not necessarily wait a year, but go ahead and implement the policy um, and then as we have a committee that gets together and works with Jess and, and Laura that we go ahead and change it as needed along the way and not necessarily wait for that year to, to come mm -hmm. around. For instance, if we do approve this as it is tonight, um, if we have a committee that works with Jess if they want to change it and then say a month or two from now they want to come before us and change that policy, we should then at least, you know, honor that and, and then vote on it again. That would just be my, my consideration. But, all right. Anything else from council members? I would be vehemently opposed to what uh, Mr. Shinnett just suggested. I think, as Penny said, once you have something in policy, it's really difficult to change it. I think we've heard enough objections tonight to various parts of the proposed policy that should give us all pause to step back and reconsider the elements in there, the individual language changes that have been suggested. And I, I would be very hesitant to ever consider approving a policy that we're intending on changing. And as numerous people have said, it's been 100 years that we've been without this policy. I, I think we can probably go a few more months and give the public and the rec committee and the renew board events committee time to hammer it out a little further so that it's more palatable for everybody. Um, Mr. Mayor, I think um, lost my train of thought. So the recreation committee uh, in itself, when in when the bylaws get written, that will put some parameters around who's in that committee. I think we have to be um, thoughtful of the fact that. Uh, the folks that are in this room that have voiced their opinion, many of which are usually hosting events in the community, uh, and they have a certain understanding from their perspective and their community about what the needs and desires are from their point of view. And what I think we haven't heard a good sampling from is the general taxpayer who probably doesn't have uh, a 
an understanding of what's happening right now. Um, and if we have the Renew for Events Committee um, put information or um, opinions in on the policy, I think that can tell us one side of the story very clearly, um, but it's not going to give us all sides of the story. There's certainly um, an interest there. I think that we can pass that. So I just think we should take that into account as well. Determining what committee is working with us on this, I think, would be really helpful. <laughs> I also think any new rent committee members are going to have to go through the same process as our planning commission and DRB members. But I think that they have to submit perhaps a letter of interest and then they're interviewed. So there is a there is a process for um, people coming on board on committees like that that already exist that I think we want to adopt for that as well. That's a big undertaking. At this particular moment in time, we're, um, we're at a point where um, the rec department really needs a policy to move forward. And right now, we've got an accordion with people um, waiting to see what's going to happen. We've got to move something. I wonder, Mr. Mayor, what is the, the procedure to change a policy? Is it really as frightening as it sounds to have a policy? We approve this policy if you so choose. You could change it. You can change it. You could change it two, three, four, five months down the road. So we would come back to you after we've had some experience and gained some um, sea legs. After we've gotten some legs. Maybe invite those who have gone through the process to come in and talk about their experience. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. I've heard a lot of different things. I've heard the rec department needs a policy. I've heard it's the council's policy. Um, the council is trying to come up with a policy. It's only for the purpose of the council having criteria. There's a lot of different things being thrown around that really aren't making sense. Um, and one of the things that you said earlier, Jess, is that there's $337,000 in the recreation budget, but how much of that is recaptured in, in fees? I think it leaves about, what, $100,000 left that is actually taxpayer money, correct? Uh, well, all of that is taxpayer money, and the money that comes in as revenue helps to offset that. Right. Um, there is, um, yeah. So, and the other thing I wanted to mention, to, uh, I guess this is off topic, but yes, that, that's true. It's closer to 148 that you get, and um, all of those dollars have to be accounted for. We have to anticipate revenues. If we don't hit those revenue anticipations, then we have to uh, underspend our budget to make up for it. So that 300 and some odd thousand dollars is, is exactly what Jess said. Those are taxpayer dollars. There's a whole formula that goes into um, equating that at the end of the fiscal year. It's not easy. Sure. And the, um, the revenues are all guesses based on past trends that you can't predict if the weather's going to have an impact or anything like that. Um, those uh, those taxpayer dollars it, are very limited. As you know, you sat on the Board of Civil Authority. Um, you've been an advocate for in increasing the grand list, but that's the, um, the whole reappraisal and the Board of Civil Authority just reduced the grand list by about a million five. <coughs> We're going to be generating another budget. Um, that budget is probably going to go up uh, less than 3%. That's just based on things as is. That's not taking into consideration um, an events line item or, or um, taking these fees that just has proved is costing the city and folding them into a new line item. But to so stay on topic. Uh, that that is on topic. A year and a half it's, ago. It's, it's all taxpayer dollars. Right, That's in the I'm budget saying. setting process a year and a half ago, I believe that the public had a huge outcry when it was jokingly suggested that the rec, uh, rec budget be be cut and then not have a rec department. I think the public was really clear that they value recreation and value the things that come out of the recreation department. And if we want to consider the taxpayers who are not here, then let's give them the opportunity to give their input. I, I think that's a really important point, that you do have advocates in the room, and we haven't heard the other side, so, so let's give it time and hear the, the other side too. You could put that on for a warrant. You could actually vote on it. Next year, can you really get done? I'm going to go to Jennifer, and then I'm going to call the vote. Why don't you call it guidelines as opposed to a policy? It's not as onerous, and then you can work on changing them easily because they're just guidelines, suggestions. You're just 
incorporate and suggest it. We're going to call the vote now. Call on the vote. We've gone on, and so we have a motion. Is there? And there was a second. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Two ayes and two noes. Knowing that the policy can be revisited, knowing that knowing that we can implement it and see how it works with the upcoming six events. It doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't discourage anything at all. It just sets guidelines. And I know I'm the one who asked for a policy way back because I saw haphazardness um, in the years sitting at this table. It was just, I'll do, I'll do an analogy. We came up with the tax stabilization policy at this table when I became mayor because councils were picking and choosing who to give tax stabilization to. This just sets parameters and guidelines to help make the job easier. It can be modified. We modified that other policy. It can be modified at any time um, as it's worked on. And with all that, I will vote aye. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the authorization to sign warrants and a vote. Mr. Johnson, will you explain? Uh, so we've been uh, calling people in to sign the warrants and off weeks for a long time. It came to my attention that it really wasn't what was supposed to be done. So I looked it up and uh, the council can authorize one or more people to sign those warrants on behalf of the council in the off weeks. Uh, the reason we need to do that is because we can't wait two and sometimes three weeks between council meetings to get bills paid in the city. Uh, people are expecting their money. And it's, you know, if we are late on the payments on some company to charge interest, then they, we can't have that. So I would suggest that, uh, I think this is done one time in the past before where they appoint authorized the mayor to go down and sign the warrant. Uh, if you do that, him and somebody else, two people, one or two, uh, they can sign the warrant for them. You will get a list of everything that was signed for it and what, who was paid and the amounts for the rest of the council and see what the amounts were. Otherwise, we have to wait each county meeting to sign warrants, and sometimes we just, we just can't do that. I mean, that's, I called along with the cities and towns. I said, do you realize how cumbersome that is if we have to wait three weeks to sign warrants? She said, I know it's not the best thing, but that's the way it is. So I would like to see you appoint somebody down and read those warrants and sign them. Somebody, or some two persons, whatever you want, to come in on the off weeks and sign those warrants. I recommend two people in case one's on vacation. That's what I would do. Uh, so, two great. So no, that's, that's, what, you want. that's what I would do, at least, because if you just have one and they're on vacation and you need someone to sign right. it and they're not authorized, you have to have somebody to sign it. <coughs> so, <coughs> so, we would need a, a motion. I uh, move that we appoint the mayor and uh, Mr. Chenette to approve and sign the warrants for the disbursement of operating expenses. Motion to be made. Is there discussion on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, is that a second? Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Okay, it was the motion was to authorize the mayor and Mr. Chenette, who is also the president of the council of the board of aldermen, um, to come in and sign the warrants. Any discussion now? Does that have to be the both of them, or can it be just one of them that one of you is on vacation? One, the other, or both. Okay. As long as there's at least one. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion on <coughs> that? So, so the motion should be either Dennis, the mayor, right. or Dennis, right. not Ann. 
should be or. Mm -hmm. Should be the word that, or, yeah. not and. Yeah, I'm going to change your motion to that then. Yeah, so. It could be uh, and or. Yeah. The mayor so, and or. So I'd like to amend the motion so after it says we appoint mayor, we put in the words and or. Okay, and in order for that motion to be given, I will withdraw my second. Okay. Now, well, you, can oh, second the amendment. you can second the amendment. Okay, then I will second the amendment. Okay. It's a Any discussion on the on that? Just one, one question. Um, can you be a little more specific, Mr. Johnson, about what that list would look like for those of us who weren't signing it'll the be that, It'll be that list. You'll be able to cover sheet. And how would be that, the vendor and the amount paid. Oops. The one you signed. Right, right. The with, one, with the one the you're signing now will be the one you get. Maybe the itemized list. And how regularly? Huh? How regularly are you thinking? Well, after the warrants are signed, we'll send out a list for everybody. Do you have it available at each council meeting? So it would be a, available at each council no, meeting? We'll just, after those are signed, I'll just take a photocopy of those and then send you know, it off to anybody on the council. I know school boards do this. Um, they authorize and then the members get a copy. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't get all the invoices, right. of course. They just get mm -hmm. the sheet that we've signed, and it has the total discount amount and amount paid. Well, I'll just scan and email them off. And if we wanted to see the invoice that accompanied that, then <coughs> we would be able to look at it. Okay. Okay. Anything else? No. Any other questions? Discussion? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Next item, um, water request, Fresh Start Community and Garden. And I'll let the city manager uh, <coughs> give a little background. Um, at the April 2nd meeting, the community gardens folks came in and let us know that they were going to be removing their uh, garden from Gardner Park and asked for water to be provided at the Lake Road Garden site. Um, I, had done, I had done a little bit of research because I didn't know that there was a water um, set up at the Lake Road site. And we went back through the minutes. We started in 2009 and came um, forward and we did not find that there was approval or water allocation for that particular site. So apparently sometime at approximately, I think it was 2013, they were provided water, um, but it's not in our billing system. There's not a, a record of allocation. And um, normally a situation like that would go through council approval and we couldn't find where that happened. So um, I wanted to offer the um, Fresh Start Community Garden um, a water allocation request so we could get that process started. They can fill this out. They can um, come to the council and let you know what they're requesting. And um, you can decide whether or not you'd like to move forward with offering them free water. And that seems like a good way to get it on the record and get it trackable. You also may want to consider um, installing a water meter for them for this year so that we have an idea of how much water would be used. And that way, um, the council can have an idea of how to proceed next year as well. That way, it's a little more um, on the record, fair and equitable. And um, it treats them just like everybody else is treated. And I believe, or, and just, I just want to interject how ordinance, I believe the ordinance requires allocation okay. requests to yeah. come to the council. That's what that is. That's an allocation request. Um, if folks choose that that's a good way to proceed. <coughs> Can I ask Mr. Vermeer a question? Oh, is he here? Tom? Tom is here. Yeah, Tom. Uh, is this just a... Uh, faucet coming out of the ground right now yes so it doesn't have any cover or anything does it have a curb stop so you can shut it off in the winter oh yeah it's shut off okay. yeah, you have to turn it back on it's just <coughs> the old-fashioned spigot just hook the handle up and they have water but it's shut off in the ground now do we have to put a meter on it this year or could we just put a flow meter on it and monitor it and see how much uses there actually is well you'd have to, you'd have to put a meter on it to, to capture the gouges 
Because if you do that, you're going to have to put a little building around it or something to protect it. No, 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 not in the summer months. No. No, the meter, we do the same thing at the high school. Just Stop throw the, the meter field, on. Football and field, we put a meter on it. Okay. Mr. Schnack. Um, you said that it would be safe during the summer months. What about the winter months? <laughs> well, they're not going to be watering the garden in the winter months, so the meter would come off. Right. We'd, only okay. put, we'd only put it out there during the summer months when they're using the water. Okay, so there's no problem with you bring it on, taking it off. No. Okay. Not at all. All right, thank you. Yeah, Come on. Yeah. Okay. Um, when we started up the Lake Road Garden, um, it was with the Numia, and I asked Tom to help us with the water. We watered two years by hand. As I said, that's a huge garden space. And I asked him to hook us up with the water. We were willing to pay to put a spigot. And yes, um, it was donated by the city manager or the city, whoever, which we were very grateful for. Um, in the six years that I have ran Fresh Start, I have not once asked for any funds from you guys to help run our gardens. Yes, we have used land, which was, you guys were gracious enough to let us use at Gardner, and unfortunately, because of circumstances that haven't worked out, doesn't mean we don't want to work with you. Doesn't mean that we want to dissolve our uh, working partnership with you guys. We are in Newport, we like Newport. I have lived in Newport my whole life. So it doesn't mean that we don't want to have a working partnership with you guys. Um, we still want to continue to have a what is that called? Symbiotic relationship? Is that the right word? <laughs> Symbiotic <laughs> relationship? <laughs> so, the water is very important, obviously, and if we have to truck water over there, because, as I said before, I would be the one paying for this. I've never asked you guys for anything, so if you guys would be nice enough to grant us... <clears throat> sorry. I'm not getting emotional. Um, grant us the use of the water at Lake Road. You guys unfortunately have been paying for the water for Gardner Park and for Lake Road for the last. Gardner Park since 2010, for the Lake Road since 2013. Unfortunately with us not being on Gardner Park, you won't be paying for that water. I know you don't have a line item for it, but you won't have that additional bill. So it would be less than you would be paying for if we were still at Gardner Park. So that's my request. Um, with your help, keep in mind, we've already given out 18,000 pounds of food. Yes, it's a big garden on Lake Road, and I want to put out 7,000 pounds of food this year to the residents in Newport. If you guys help us with the water, you guys are going to help us put out that food. That's all I have to say. Thank you. In, in our city plan, there's three areas that talk about the gardens. One of them is uh, Section S, which gives a good explanation of the gardens. And there's two other places uh, when we talk about priorities. One of the priorities is the city helping expand these gardens. All right. It seems to me now that we're bringing them backwards rather than pushing it forward. So we really have to think. We all have to think. What's the real value of the garden in the community? Is it the water? I know I had a garden and I didn't water as much as people think. Because, you know, we get plenty of rain up here usually through the right. summer until August. This year it's so, so, you know, <laughs> if, if anything, you know, they, they could get a moisture meter and determine how, you know, does it need watering rather than just watering. And I think uh, we'd find that uh, it would move along well. We actually have soaker hoses for that garden over there, and we actually mulch a little bit. I don't use straw anymore because we know the mice. But um, we have soaker hoses, so we actually only have to water every two to three days over there. So we don't have to have as much water over there. And it's clay over there is loaded, so it stays wet a lot longer. Yeah, I would be willing to make a motion, and I've also got a question. That's yeah. an allocation form. You can't put any gallons on there unless you have an idea or a guideline as to how much water would be used. So, 
that being said, I'll make a motion. <laughs> I move that the city, one, installs a meter on the lake road water connection, and two, we allow the community gardens to use water at that location free of charge for this 2018 season as a pilot program, and three, that the council revisit future use of water for that site after the 2018 season. And by doing that, that would give the applicants, as well as the city, an idea as to how many gallons they would be allocating. But it'll be all free of charge. It just it gives you an idea of how much is used, like exactly. this, this upcoming year. So a motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Motion made, second it. Discussion. Did you? I'm not even taking out a turn. But is that private property? No. Yes, it is. It was donated for us to use because. What we do is we take unclaimed lawns, reclaimed parking lots, and we make them into community gardens that anybody in the city can come and use for. Yes. My question is, though, I'm not saying that you need to pay. I'm just saying that the landowner owns the water, correct? So no, he does not. On that spot, it's actually a, he does, oh, does not, he does not own the water in that spot. It was water that we had ask for them to put off of the main that comes off the road. It's not out of his building. I, I, I wasn't sure if it was fed from the, the factory. If no. It was, uh, uh, right no. It's fed from the road. It's me, but off the main, right, Tom? Okay, any other questions? Yes. I just want to say, Jen, you and your board have been so very gracious. Uh, I'm stunned, actually, that after what you went through a few weeks ago and the wonderful presentation that you gave us, to now have to come back and face this uh, formality when really the city should be saying thank you so much for growing food and giving people the opportunity to work together and till the land and feed each other and feed hungry people. We'll give you all the water that, that you could possibly need for as many gardens as you want. That's what I would say. And I'm offended that this is even on the agenda again. And I hope everybody else is too. Well, it had to be put on the agenda because we have bookkeeping aspects. I didn't even know there was a spigot over there. I had no idea. This council didn't know. I didn't know there was proper procedure. No, I, no, no. I the went former through, city manager. I tried. No, it's no fault of I anybody tried. here. It's the former city manager went ahead and did it. And you know, didn't follow our own ordinance, basically. Mm -hmm. Our ordinance requires those to be filled out and to come to the council, so pretty much the former city manager didn't bring it to us. So when, when, you, when you asked about water, I think you asked me, I said, water? One time I think you asked me, I said, what that water? That was last year. Yeah, I said, what water? And I had no idea there was a connection over there. I really didn't, you know, and that was the former manager. So this is really a formality of just following what our ordinance says. I mean, because if we don't follow the ordinance and we just allow a connection here and a connection there, we have to have record keeping too for our, for our books. Everybody has to be treated the same. And filling out the water allocation helps our record keeping as you say. But it also lets the taxpayers know what they're absorbing. And that's, that's what we're talking about with the events policy. That's what we're talking about this. We're not saying don't come and ask for water. We're saying we need to have our record's complete, and this is the process, and it's the same process everybody else has to go through. That seems fair. And I think Mr. Chenette's motion for the only the one year is because we mm -hmm. can't tie the future council and say, you can have free water forever. That's the issue. We'd have to go to the voters for a vote to, to am I correct with that one? I'm assuming, yeah, for the voters to approve if you wanted the free water forever. We'd have to have our actual vote. Or any future council. Or any future council, because we cannot bind a future council with that aspect. So that's why he made the motion the way he did. Uh, I have, Colleen was before Was me. she before you? Okay, yeah. Colleen. I would put forth that 18,000 pounds of food in an economy where we have a number of seniors who live month to month, sometimes day to day, that the least our fair city could do is offer an in-kind donation of that water. Thank you. 
I'd like to respond. We are offering an in-kind donation. We cannot bind a future council. So that is why it is only for one year. Then you can go to the vote. We can only do it for one year. We cannot bind a future council. Our city charter is clear about it. We cannot bind a future council. Uh, are you okay with it for the one year? I understand, but... You know, I, if, I understand if, that. We can put a I'm thing good. on the ballot, you know, to do it. Mr. Shannon, did you have something? I did. Uh, it also it allows us, as well as you folks, to know what we are donating to that group as an in kind <coughs> value. Plain and simple. And then can. Yeah. And then I'm call a motion. I think what's been coming across, particularly after the last meeting, whether you intend it or not, is a lack of respect for the community garden. This is an incredible program, and the city of Newport has had a lot of mileage from it. It's been used in presentations. I mean, whoever, probably none of you who are sitting here right now, have used it in presentations. AARP has used it, the city has used it, Karen Garrity has used it in grant applications. So the city's had a lot of mileage. People are getting great food from it. It's used as a community center. It's a really important part of Newport. It's a loss for Newport that it will no longer be in Gardner Park. In particular, those of us who've been involved with the farmer's market, we see families going in there and using, they're not gonna be able to do that anymore. They're going to have to transfer to the one on Spring Street or the one at Lake Road. That will probably happen. But this is so important to Newport. Please don't minimize it. it. <laughs> <laughs> you can have something quick, well, yeah. two things. I missed the last meeting. Is it their choice that they're not going to be over here in Gardner Park, or is there something there that pushed them out? It, is, it was our choice to leave after a meeting that we had because that during the centennial time, when we are usually doing the beautifications, they require us to do certain things that will get that area ready that is when during our planting time and it won't be ready. And last year there was issues with beautification. This year there's issues and we just don't have time and my board decided that we were pulling it just because there's been issues for the last two years back and forth with beautification and whatnot and other issues. So we just pulled it out of there because like Jess said, there's probably a better spot over there for a community garden besides the corner that the master gardeners and the council at the time put it in over in that corner. And so it was just better off. I've never seen a problem with it. It's always been well taken care of and it's always been well maintained. Okay, so we and have. I'm hoping after this year that, I don't care what the meter shows, it should go on the ballot for free water. Mm -hmm. Because stuff is coming back into the community today. The earth, three quarters of the earth is covered with water. So it's not like we're gonna go well, you can no. help me do a petition, so let me pass. Okay, so motion. Can I make a couple comments? Yes. Uh, well, on a comment on the meeting we had with Jen. Uh, I was at that meeting. Jen was there. One of our board of directors was there. Laura was there. Jess was there. Mac was there. Uh, the city did not ask for that meeting. No, I'm not saying so I just asked for that meeting. You said your statement. Let me finish mine. They asked for the meeting. Did we have an issue with we had looked over there? We asked them if they could move the shed, not to do away with the shed, move the shed to the back of the garden and paint the white tires and the box of green to blend in so we blend in over there. Uh, the direct department even offered to move the shed. They offered to supply the paint to do it. And when we left that meeting, uh, everybody seemed to be in agreement. Uh, Bob was there, one of the directors. He said the soil over there wasn't any good and there was more weeds over there. It was a losing battle. They weed it one day and the next day they're right back. Yeah. And the statement was also made, I think we, Bob made a statement that they weren't producing enough food over there at that time to uh, uh, warrant the weeding yeah. and all that right. stuff. So everybody left there in agreement. And we thought 
through various agreements, yeah. And lo and behold, the next week they come in and say they're moving the garden. Nobody forced them to move the garden. That was strictly their decision. I never said anybody did. Okay, we I'm need glad. to. I'm I said what was no, the problem. You said was okay, okay, I did okay, not come back and say the city. No, Paul just meant. No, no, we need to have says, a vote. We need to have a vote. Things should be twisted. And I'm getting tired of every time I or somebody else or something in here has been twisted. I asked what the problem was with the garden not being over there. I didn't blame the city. And the other comment I made was like, the, when I saw it over there, it's a, I have no problem with either way. I'm not blaming anybody, Jim. Well, I, didn't I, say you were. I look okay. at it this way. Right. You said okay. you wanted to know okay. if anybody forced them out. That vote was okay. made. Right. That decision right. was made. It's but over. Just, we are here to talk about water and the water request. And that is the motion on the floor, is the water request. The decision to move it was made by their board of directors. I look at that as being over. They've chosen the other site. And they're going to use Numir. We have a motion on the floor. And I'm going to call the motion right now. All those in favor of installing a water meter, doing a study for one year, and revisiting it in 2000, basically 2019. That's any other discussion? And all those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Can I Thank just you. note? I would like to vote yes with the um, with the note that I'm only voting yes because it is not allowable to continue the permission for more than one year. So I would strongly, strongly prefer to grant. So you agree with one year? Uh, I was, you agree with the one here or you don't agree? I am voting yes, but only right. because uh, <coughs> it can't go beyond one year at a time. If I could make it go beyond one year, that's what I would vote for, and therefore I would vote no to this one. So with this, we can work it out. In the I wait off to this but until we get the number. Okay. <laughs> let me know what you're trying to tell me. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. confused yeah. now. Sorry, no, no, I know you what you're I know you yes. Oh, never mind. Yes, I'm just going to make sure I don't know. Okay. The next item, Town Roads and Bridge Standards Annual Compliance Public Works Director. We need a vote. There was a question at the last. Here is the form. This is the standard that we usually fill out every year and, some, and, and vote, so we need a motion. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we go ahead and approve the uh, certification of the roads and standards. Uh, certification of compliance for uh, all right, all the same thing. So a motion's been made. Is there a second? Uh, made, oh, made by Mr. Schnett, seconded by Mr. Wallen, to approve the certification of compliance for town road and bridge standards and network inventory. And we do have a corrected copy. It was accidentally checked in the wrong box when we got that packet. So it's been corrected. So who's to the and all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. ACCD Newport Feasibility Planning Grant Award Resolution. Laura? This is also standard operating procedure, and um, the grant 
the two grants that we've received, one was the planning grant, one was the expanded scope grant, are ready uh, to be to allow us to draw down. So in other words, we've uh, paid our bills, um, we've done a, uh, the reporting within the IntelliGrant system, everything has been approved. We have to go through this formality in order to allow us to draw down um, the funds that we've expended so far. So I'm asking, uh, we have to have this on the agenda, and we also need to have a formal motion to sign this in order to uh, fulfill the obligation that we have for our record keeping. So I'm asking for a motion to approve the grant agreement resolution. And you will fill in the city of Newport, yeah. all that on this. I will. So I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll we'll make that motion that we go ahead and approve the grant agreement resolution be signed and forwarded on submitted. The motion to be made. Is there a second? I'll second. Made and seconded. Discussion? And all those in favor Actually, say. Actually, I just have one comment. Um, it would be great to see the reporting and the, the final results of, of those grants. Everything is on our public web page. It's under downtown development documents. It's up to date as much as we have. The um, Vermont, um, the VHB um, waterfront and downtown master plan isn't done yet. Definitely. We'll be hearing about that hopefully in June. Great, thank you. Anything else? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. HRA annual contract resolution. We need a motion and a vote. And this is the standard for our HRA plan that is part of the union contracts, both union contracts and the not the non-union staff. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we have to do every year for MVP health. So we need a motion to authorize the signature. I think it's to execute the agreement. To execute the agreement. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certificate of resolution yes. and the execution of the yeah. agreement. I need both of them. Someone care to make a motion? I'll make that motion that we go ahead and approve the execution of the agreement as well as the resolution for the MVP health care. A motion to be made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Made and seconded. Discussion? <coughs> I'm curious as to why we're voting now when the effective date of the agreement was January 1st. Two reasons. Um, we've had some employee changes and everybody's starting to hit their um, um, out-of-pocket expenses <coughs> now, so their HRA is starting to kick in now. I'm not quite sure how that answers the question. Wouldn't it be... Uh, required by MVP to have it, the execution agreement signed before it was, you know, the date where it was supposed to be in effect. It's, it's, it's the same to be effective January 1st. Nobody met their um, out-of-pocket expenses till now. We're having a lot of activity now. So 
So if we didn't agree to this, then people's claims wouldn't be paid? We'd have a real problem. So if somebody had met their uh, deductibles, if they had surgery on, say, January 2nd, then what would happen when they wanted to use their HRA funds? We would have gotten your um, communication from MPP. I mean, you used to be in, in HR, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this can't come as any new information for you. Well, not having an agreement in, in effect until several months after it's supposed to be executed, that's why I'm questioning it. It's, it's standard. There's nothing weird here as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I don't know what more I can tell you. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Then all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Do I sign both pages? Please. Next item is the early, I call it early childhood parade. Is Jess still here? Not still here. Okay, so the, uh, you guys saw in your packets, this is an application, um, one that is reoccurring year after year. They've been doing this, it sounds like, for a little over 20 years. This is on their application here. Uh, Diane Nichols Fleming submitted this application. Um, she didn't submit it until the 19th, or no, let's see. This, the, 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 the application was completed around the 11th of April, so we didn't have time to bring this to a department head meeting, um, which is our typical process for any large event or something that has a parade type thing in it. So we kind of ushered this forward. I did uh, send out an, an email to department heads today just with the application attached, asked them to review it and give me a thumbs up. I heard back from police and fire, which are the two most relevant. But this is a the same uh, type of event that they've done every year. There's not anything different. So we were confident that we could pop this into tonight's council meeting and move forward about um, picking it apart or looking at it in the department head meeting um, because we're pretty familiar with the workings of it. Um, so what they are asking for, as you can see in your memo, is um, looking to host their parade on May 3rd, uh, which begins at the Gateway Center, travels down Main Street over the Caus Causeway Bridge, ends up in Gardner Park where they have um, some festivities. They usually do like free ice cream and um, things like that in the park um, for kids and, and families to, to be in that parade. Uh, the impact for the city with the revised um, numbers that I sent you is $12,008. Or $1,208. That's the estimated impact uh, taking into their green space rental. Of course, the staffing time that it takes for flyers and all of that stuff to go out and direct traffic and close the road for the parade or, de or to reroute traffic. Last year, uh, they had the same request. Uh, the rates are different because our rates are different every year and they, they change a little bit. Uh, last year, Building Bright Futures contributed $37.50. It seems like an odd number, but at that time, under the policy or the, the process that we had, that was their damage deposit. We don't have the damage deposit anymore. Uh, but they did submit their $25 um, application fee. So they have already put down $25. Uh, last year, the space is supported with $825. So we covered the, the cost for the parade and a portion of the field use. So this year, they're looking for a, the entire amount to be waived. The $1,208 to be waived. Yes. Um, and I believe I forwarded, I forwarded along Diane's letter from you guys, too. Mm -hmm. She was able to make it current. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that the City Council approve this request and forgive the not twelve thousand, but twelve hundred and eight dollars <laughs> for the early childhood parade. <laughs> motion to be made for a second. Since I didn't have to make this motion, I'll second it. Motion to be made, seconded. Discussion from anyone. 
How long do they block off traffic? Um, the parade steps off around 10. Typically for our parade route, we meet with staff around 9, have the road closed by about 9.45 to get traffic running smoothly before the kids come out, and then they're usually to the park by um, it's less than that, maybe half an hour from start to finish. Um, I'd say traffic can expect to be rerouted for about an hour. We do leave one lane open during this event. It's a carefully um, orchestrated process that we've been practicing a lot. My question is, is this a supervisory union function? I mean... It's co-sponsored by uh, the North Country Supervisory Union and Building Bright Futures. So the supervisory union, are they underwriting part of it? Is that how that works? Um, the certificate holder is the supervisory union for the, um, the insurance. <coughs> I think it's a, a partnership between Building Bright Futures and yes. the supervisory union. Because I have that insurance policy. Mm -hmm. To clarify, the supervisory unit is a member of the Building Bright Futures yeah. Regional Council, which Lisa can speak to. Oh, yeah. I'm a member of the, of the Building Bright Futures Council. We've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, it's a great event. You know, the last two years we've had over 500 kids. Um, and the, the amount is quite exorbitant for the budget we have, and I'm not sure if we could continue to do the parade um, if we had to come up with that as our own well, no, I, the reason why I was asking is I look at supervisory union, mm -hmm. the union of all the communities. Mm -hmm. If they could, if they could help fund some of it, see what I'm getting at. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not against waiving, but I just look at the, I look at all these communities: Wright, and Charleston, Coventry, Derby, Ferdinand, Hull, Jay, Wool. You know, they're all outside of Newport. Yes, they all pay taxes like we do, but we're bearing the extra cost on paper. And I just wanted, that's all I'm stressing is that this is what the reason why we've had this big discussion this whole evening is things like this. Because when I look at the supervisory union, it's the union of all the communities and all the kids coming in. You know, I don't get me wrong, it's not a bad event. I mean, it's, it's a great event, but I just wanted to point that out. And Lisa brings up a good point. In order to make this uh, an event like this happen, whether it's for the children or for any any event, whenever we run a parade route, it's um it's pulling all of our staff off of their usual posts to do these things. And you can see that the breakdown of the fees is right there. So to ha make this happen, uh, there is a cost to it, and it does it, do it is an impact. Um, and you can see that that's a pretty large bill when it comes down to the hourly wage, but that is the price of it. So this is if the if the city you know, decides to approve this, this is a pretty large contribution that we're all um, stepping in. If you haven't been there to see this well-orchestrated um, reroute of traffic, I would highly encourage any of our council members to come if and when you know this event is approved. Come and meet us this. down at 9 o'clock and put yeah. the vests on and watch fun. what we do uh, so to I make this run so No, it is a big event. Yeah, it is. So. And the kids really love having law enforcement there. That's yeah. part of it. It's kind of a big deal for them. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool to be. Can I make a comment? It's, it's a wonderful event. It's a lot of kids and a lot of parents. They spend money while they're downtown. They're not just standing on the street looking decorative. They go into the stores, they buy coffee, they buy popcorn. The kids go and shop and pick and shovel or wherever afterwards. It's, it's a full day. It's not as simple as this is what it costs us. It's also what is this bringing to us? And we shouldn't forget that. No, it's right in the application. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of hard working volunteers. The city council just voted in the uh, city of Newport events policy, right? Is this, does that apply to approving this event? So if we use this as an example to walk through that process, we certainly can. They've met all of the criteria and gone through all of the processes to this point to bringing it to council. So um, Diane submitted the application, got interaction from me, got it requested to be on the agenda. Unfortunately, wasn't able to make it, but made a request in writing, which is what the policy lays out to do. It then brings it forth to the council. The council can then look in the policy section with, and ask these questions of the event. And the policy section says that support levels will be determined based on strategic considerations and the number of criteria met. So for kicks, let's just go down through and see it. Does it meet it? This event takes place within Newport City limits. Yes. Uh, the event is compatible with complements and is not in competition with events hosted by the city of Newport. Yes. We're not hosting anything at the same time that's going to compete. Is the event open to the public, accessible to Newport City residents, and provides service in a non-discriminatory non manner? Yes, it's open to everyone. 
Um, the majority of funds raised, well, this is not a fundraising event, so that's not applicable. Um, the event organization is addressing a recognized community need. This one has a little bit more material to it, um, so without some research, I'm not sure if we can answer that, yes or no. Um, so let's skip to the next one. Is there a substantial return on investment? That's what you guys just said. Is there? Yeah, sounds like there is. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, does the event organizer's experience, qualifications, and responsiveness promote a positive working relationship with the city? Diane is great. They've always been great to work with. They, they cross their T's, dot their I's. She's done an awesome job every year, and we have a, an established routine of working well with these guys. So, okay. All right. I have a question. I'm at, I, I, I realize, so if I'm understanding, because I'm just trying to be clear, that those are the policy, uh, I, I understand where you were reading, there were some other things, though, earlier in what the city council just voted on under, like, general principles, I'm trying to understand, it says, like, one, two, three, four, events should demonstrate financial viability, long-term self-sustainability, and an effort to seek broad-based support where the city is not relied upon indefinitely as the primary source of resources. So I guess I'm, I'm speaking to your point earlier, that mean, Mayor, about well, no, that, I think the that meant spent. direct financial. That means like we, and so you mean direct financial? Well, well, it can be either because it, it says be primary either. source of resources, but these guys do have a well-rounded base of support. They are getting. Um, Pick and Shovel donates the ice creams, the Dirty Road right. Store donates right. the ice cream cones, Building Bright Futures does the free books, the supervisory union or the entertainment the does dance. the entertainment, there's a lot of music there. So they're not relying solely on the city, they're making an effort elsewhere to, to support this event, making it a community event. I guess I don't understand the difference between the cost to the city of 1200 bucks every year, if, if that's, uh, I mean, let me say I'm all for this organization. I'm just trying to get my head around the impacts of the policy that has just been voted in and whether it is retroactively, and as I see you're <coughs> shaking your head, I, I, I'm just trying to understand how this event is going to be equitably, I mean how this policy is going to be equitably administered we have a real life situation here that's costing the city money, and and they just and, and the other thing that the policy says somewhere is that there should be just I think two months request in advance, and I thought I heard you say that this request came in on the 11th, which is a, a few days ago. So I guess I don't. I think that's a little nitpicking on this one. I well, really do if you're looking at the dates. She, I really she makes up a good point, but that's the beauty of the word should. Should be, but because for all the reasons that I stated, that these guys have been doing this for many years, we're very well versed in the process, we were able to expedite this. By, so that's, every event we get is going to have its own unique things. It's not a cookie cutter thing, but we have to weigh all of these things. So yes, even though they should submit it two months in advance, because of all the other reasons we stated before, I think from my point of view as the Parks and Recreation Department, I felt comfortable bringing this forward. Actually, Jess, it says organizers <laughs> must submit an application and satisfy all requirements in accordance with Newport Parks and Recreation Building. It, uh, at least two months in advance. It doesn't say should. Yes, sir. I, I think. Uh, I think th this is where enforcement might apply. So I think uh, you know we're overstepping. I mean, I could have had this item as done. number. If I had had this as item number one or number whatever before that, it would have would have been a moot point. It's just the way it fell on the agenda. You see what I'm yes. saying? My, my question would be if there's, <coughs> if there's six applications in the. Uh, in the funnel, are they going to get the same? That's the whole date, date wise. Policy. No, right. date wise. You know, if it's late or, you know, oh, is this going to apply to the six that you already have? Basically, you're saying they, they grandfathered in at this point. Yes. Yeah. But the ones that we already have are not on the agenda tonight because they are. They do meet that threshold. The only yeah. one that didn't was this one. Right. Okay. So this is the only one. Yeah, I don't think we can hold them to that. No. 
I'm not suggesting that they do. I'm just trying to get my head around how this is going to work. That's all. But for the purposes of a new event, say this was a new event, I would not feel comfortable without having spoke, talked it over with my department heads and gone through that process because we, uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not all the magical keeper of all the, the knowings. And so, if this was a new event and we didn't have that understanding, then I, I probably would have. Okay. We have a motion. Can we have it seconded? Any other discussion on waiving the fees? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. On behalf of uh, Building Bright Futures, thank you very much. New businesses on behalf of the chief of, to keep our certification for the emergency operations plan. I had to attend uh, an ICS overview, which is an incident command center system overview. I just want to let the council know that I did do that, so we'll meet the state requirements for our, our emergency operations plan. So I just wanted to bring that up. <coughs> Mr. Shenet, any no. new business? No, Mr. Ross. No, okay. Mr. Johnson, old business? No. Mr. Charbonne? No. Okay. Just real quick, uh, I, I had asked several months ago about getting email addresses for planning commission members, and I, I just wanted to put that reminder out there that perhaps once the new members are appointed that they could be assigned city email addresses. Do you want to bring, do you want to respond to that? To the the rules. That'll have to be done through the web provider because if it's through the, I didn't think if it's through the, remember we tried to build those on Blue Post and it wouldn't accept the addresses unless we switched everything over to Blue Post. Right, that's right. Yeah. We only have so many um, through the Google, and then to add the five additional was going to cost. Uh, forget how much money. But if we switched everything through the domain host, we would be able to provide more. But then we lose feasibility. Laura, was it? We lose some of the functionality. So perhaps that we could discuss that at a later meeting of how to overcome that, that hurdle because the Planning Commission would really like city email addresses so that they're not using their personal email to do city business. I don't disagree with you, Julie, at all. It would be great if we had a a city uh, website or a city uh, email address. But what some of us have already started doing, we've transferred away from our own personal addresses and um, we've established uh, you know, a separate uh, email address like wpagepc.com uh, at, at uh, gmail.com. So we, in a way, we've kind of gotten away from having our own personal email addresses and, uh, and to be more open and what have you just for planning commission business only. So it's, if, we can, if you have a, uh, a city provided um, email address, that's great. But I think we've also um, tackled this issue on our own by setting up a separate uh, email account 
only for uh, planning commission business. Um, if you're satisfied, then great. I, I am personally. I can't speak for the others, but. Uh, cool. um, Mr. Mayor, in relation to that, can that be just put up on the website then? If they have, so they don't have to have a city address then, right? Right. A lot of municipalities put up the email addresses that their members are that using for city for city or town business. Yeah. Good. That's so if you, if you all provided the, the email addresses that you've set up to the manager, <coughs> they can be put on the website. Sure. While you're signing that, can I ask, are there any new ones there? No, no. Thank you. <laughs> no, we had one new one this year, and that was a couple weeks ago. The country club done the yes. new manager. That's the only one. Thank you. Did the dual business? I'm getting. Yeah, mine was on business. Oh, so I, I had no old business. I kind of stopped when I was signing. Any old business? No, I do not. Anything, Mr. Ross? Nope. Okay. Any old business? Okay. Any old business? Okay. Now, the next regular city council meeting will be Monday, May 7th, um, 2018. And the next centennial planning meeting will be April 26th, which is a Thursday, 5 p.m. in this room. And now we need an um, Anticipated executive session pending litigation contract. One VSA 313 A1A and A1E. And we need a motion for that. Yeah, that's just, who's going to read the motion? Okay. Uh, I, before you have the re ritual reading, I was wondering if I might ask the ritual question, do you anticipate a decision to come out of this meeting? Not the first one, but the second one, yes. Okay. Um, so, could you send an email or something? Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, go ahead. We need the motion. I'll make a motion for the more specific finding that premature general public knowledge of the subject the anticipated in the next session tonight clearly place the board and the persons involved at a substantial disadvantage. Motion's been made. Discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 A